what's going on everybody so i thought i'd make a really quick video to take a look at the right to confront a witness or an individual's right to confront a witness in any criminal prosecution right so in order to do that i thought i would just start off with the basic facts so right now i am on the government's website govinfo.gov and i'm on this website and i'm actually looking at the constitution of the united states of america right as amended right and we're going to look at the confrontation clause right and so we're just going to really just skip on down to the sixth amendment and the confrontation clause goes like this it basically says in all criminal prosecution the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy trial speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation and then it goes on to say to be confronted with the witness against him to be confronted with the witness against him and then it goes on to have a compulsory process for obtaining witness in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense so that six amendment says a lot right now we're just going to focus on the confrontation portion of it and it basically says to be confronted with the witness against him. Now, notice that it doesn't elaborate on what it means to confront the witness against you. It doesn't give a lot of detail, right? You know, so it's up to, I guess, the judiciary to figure out what this actually means. It's up, up to them to determine the limits and the boundaries and one of the first things i notice is it doesn't give a time limit at what point do you get a chance to confront the witness do you get the to a chance to confront the witness before you go to trial not that you would confront a guy out in the street but you would be able to know who the witness is and you would be able to get information from the witness and you could possibly be able to do a deposition to basically get the witness testimony and the witness statements, right? So if you're in a situation where you actually can't confront the witness before trial, and again, when I say confront the witness, I'm not meaning to say that you're going to see him on the street and then you're just going to, you know, say, hey, you know, I heard you said such and such about me. Is that true? That's not what I'm talking about. There's different ways that you can confront a witness. And I'm, again, if you don't know me, if you haven't watched my videos, I am not a lawyer. And me reading this should show that I'm not a lawyer. But I'm really just some guy on the internet speaking out of the side of my head, right? So to me, it seems like there is an opportunity to confront any witness or any litigant way before you go to trial and you don't do this in the street but you can do it in the form of depositions you can engage the witness way before you get to the actual trial but this sixth amendment doesn't really define what it means to confront the witness and we're not going to look at all the different case law surrounding the sixth amendment but i'm just asking you to bring your attention that the only thing it says is that to be confronted with the witness against him it doesn't say when it doesn't say what point in the trial or in the in the litigation can you confront that person immediately i believe that you should be able to right i believe that you should be able to maybe get a deposition way ahead of time way before you go to trial i believe that you should have the ability to do pre-trial hearings where you can get more information or you can challenge that witness in a pre-trial hearing that's what i think that's that's what i believe right 
So now we are going to look at some case law, but I just kind of wanted to point this out because I think it's important that it doesn't tell you at what point in the trial process that you get a chance to confront this witness. Do you only get a chance to confront the witness at the exact moment at the trial, right? Or do you get the chance to confront the witness way before the trial begins? Uh, let me know what you think about this. Uh, leave your questions and comments below. All right, so let's just go ahead and continue on. Now, what's the purpose of the confrontation clause, right? You know, so according to case law, in this situation, Pennsylvania v. Ritchie stated that the confrontation clause provides two types of protections for a criminal defendant, the right physically to face those who testify against him and the right to conduct cross-examination. Pretty much self-explanatory. You want to face the guy who is going to put you in jail or who could possibly be lying on you or just making stuff up. And you want the chance to basically break down that person's lies and to try to trap him in his lie to essentially uh, free yourself from, you know, being potentially locked up, right? So moving on, most of this court's encounters with the confrontation clause have involved either the admissibility of out-of-court statements in Ohio v. Roberts or restrictions on scope of cross-examination, right? You know, so I basically, you know, take this section to mean that you don't want, or this case law, these case laws to I mean that you don't want people making statements out of court and then, you know, they don't show up to court and you're there, you're going to use these statements to basically try to lock you up. You don't want that situation. So the confrontation clause is supposed to protect against that. And then there could be some restrictions on the scope of the actual cross-examination, right? And if they restrict you from cross-examining the witness, then that could potentially violate your uh, right to confront the witness. So I don't really have much context for this because I've never actually questioned the witness in court. Maybe I will get the chance to do that in the future one day. I don't know. But to me, I, I take this to mean that you you want to have no limits, right? You know, short of, you know, slapping the witness around, right? You know, short of physically touching the person, you, you don't really want any limits placed on you when you get to confront this person and try to catch them in a lie, right? So obviously you're not going to be able to do anything illegal, but you, you want to question this, this, this person. You want to go through every little detail. Uh, if you have to be aggressive or treat that person as a hostile witness, then you should have the right to do that. So you, you don't want any limits. I think the confrontation clause protects against that. Well, uh, I could be misinterpreting this. You know, if you guys think differently, leave your questions and comments below. And then some other good things about the confrontation clause I found. Basically, President Eisenhower once described face-to-face -face confrontation as a part of the code of his hometown in Abilene, Kansas. In Abilene, he said it's, it's necessary to meet anyone face-to-face -face with whom you disagree. You could you would you could not sneak up on him from behind or do damage from him without suffering the penalty of an outraged uh, citizenry. In this country, if someone dislikes you or accuses you, he must come up front. He cannot hide behind the shadows. You know, so to me, that's kind of that old school, good old American thinking that honestly is a thing of the past and in my opinion i'm actually surprised that it ever existed you know so one of the funny things about uh how we are as a society and how we came to be is that i think the constitution really shaped a lot of our thinking right you know just take for example the clause not which isn't actually in the constitution but is like in the what is it the preamble that you know all men are created free and equal and independent you know I, i'm probably butchering that there and misquoting but from reading that most people believe they can just walk down the street do whatever they want to do and be whoever they want to be 
and not worry about whether or not they're going to offend somebody so long as they don't hurt anyone or violate someone's rights then you have the right to do whatever you want to do so long as you're not hurting anybody you're not violating anybody so you 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 believe in that and you think that you can do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be with the exception that you don't violate anybody else right you know so that constitutional clause or you know the preamble of the constitution and the rest of the constitution shapes our society and it controls it dictates on how we carry ourselves so i think this quote from president eisenhower is kind of like a part of that thinking that you know you can you have the right to confront people against you right you know people who who want to take you down they shouldn't be allowed to say things behind your back and they shouldn't be allowed to backstab backbite no you know come to my face and say it to my face right and it's not to say that you're going to beat that person up but it's more to say that you have a right to not be backstabbed that's essentially what it is because if you come before me face to face in front of people and you say all these bad things about me then I have the chance to basically clear my name. I think that's what that's all about. And I think that's kind of dead. That's kind of over with, you know, because we have a lot of people coming into this country and this country is changing and not a lot of people have embraced. Some of the newcomers may not have embraced this line of thinking. See, and I think this is one of the things that get Americans in trouble because when you think like this, and then you go to another country you're going to you're in for a rude awakening because people are going to stab you in the back all day long again let me let me just be clear i think the constitution has shaped our way of thinking and because it shaped our way of thinking it may have put us in a situation where we have this misconceptions about you know life and reality right the reality is is that human nature people because of human nature people will just stab you in the back and then because of human nature people will master backstabbing They're, they'll master backstabbing right i think some of us become brainwashed and you know we want to be honorable and we'll never say anything behind a person's back and because most of us was taught the constitution in school and most of us we get this president eisenhower way of thinking from our parents and you know and, it, and it's also in our religion christianity not, not everybody in the united states is christian but i'm saying uh traditional americans who were raised in a judo christian type uh, religion uh, you know, they they believe in not dragging their neighbor's name through the mud behind their back, right? And I'm just saying that, you know, this constitutional concept has shaped our way of thinking. And I'm not sure if it's good or bad. You tell me if it's good or bad. Because like I said, if you go to a different country and you go there thinking like this, you're, you're in for a rude awakening, you know? Um, by nature, people are backstabbers, and some people master the art of stabbing you in the back. So you're thinking, oh, he's not going to say anything because he's he's not going to lie lie on me because you know this is who we are and this is you know what we do. We don't stab each other in the back, but the, you know that's not true. People are stabbing each other in the back all day long all across the world so in this country we're now in a situation where we have a huge immigrant population and some of those immigrants and there's nothing wrong with immigrants there's absolutely nothing wrong with immigrants i'm not against immigrants or anything like that i'm just pointing something out and you know you have people like i've spoken to people from other countries and they told me that you're not intelligent if you can't tell a good lie you know, so to them, this is actually a sign of weakness. Uh, you know, the fact that you can't stab a guy in the back and the, the, the fact that you can't lie. And I just found that to be a fascinating perspective 
to hear someone say that you're you're essentially stupid because you don't know how to tell a good lie. And here I am all my life, I'm raised to not stab people in the back and not, you know, tell lies. You know, so anyway, I, I didn't really mean to go off on a tangent, but I just want to say that this President Eisenhower way of thinking uh, said to my face that that's old, that's done with, you go in corporate America and you're thinking like this, you're going to end your day at work with a bag full of holes, you know, so I'm just going to leave that at that. Leave your questions and comments below and let me know what you think about that. But anyway, moving on and just, you know, getting back uh, to the point here, uh, the phrase still persists, look me in the eye and say that given these human beings, I'm sorry, the phrase still persists, look me in the eye and say that give these human feelings of what is necessary for fairness. The right of confrontation c contributes to the establishment of a system of criminal justice in which the perception as well as the reality of fairness prevails. Levy, Illinois. So again, in the court system, you're supposed to be able to confront the person that is essentially telling the story about you right and you you're supposed to be able to have the opportunity according to the constitution you're supposed to have the opportunity to poke holes in that person's lies right and i think one of the things i cut off from this actual case law is that it's it's difficult for some people to lie in the presence of the person they're lying on Right. And they may not be that effective in telling a lie up front. You know, that's not necessarily true because a person that knows how to lie, they don't care if you're in front of them or not, especially in the courtroom. They're, they're still going to be able to, you know, tell a lie. It's up to you to catch them. Right. You know, so uh, just moving on here. The perception that the confrontation is essential to fairness has persisted over the centuries because there is much truth to it. A witness may feel quite differently. Oh, actually, it's here. A witness may feel quite differently when he has to repeat his story looking at the man whom he will harm greatly by distorting or misstating facts. He can now understand what sort of a man, what sort of human being that man is, right? You know, so this is all case law for the right to confront a witness in court. So I just I just want again want to just go off on a tangent a little bit here. Our laws, our constitution shape the way we treat people in public. It shapes the way we treat people at work. And I think there is a problem because like I said all my life I've been raised to not tell lies and you know to not drag people people's name in the mud but you know when i step out my door when i go to work i find that the only thing that's been done is you know people dragging each other's name through the mud and making up all these crazy stories so i don't even know what to say about all that you know so and and, and again you know somebody told me that uh the sign of intelligence is the ability to tell a lie right? A good lie and not get caught, right? So, and then, like I said, that just really, really, really kind of blew my mind. So you guys let me know what you think about uh, telling lies and whether or not it's necessary to survive in today's society. But in the courtroom, it's supposed to be wrong. You know, I've never been good at lying, you know, so I guess that's why I'm not a, uh, a millionaire by now, I guess. Anyway, so of course, as you would imagine, there are some exceptions to the confrontation clause. And I didn't get all the exceptions. I didn't get case law for all of them. But, you know, one exception is going to be against children involved in abuse cases. If the testimony would negatively impact the child or if the testimony would somehow uh, prevent the child from actually giving the testimony. Like if, if the if the case or the hearing would uh, uh, neg negatively impact the child or if the child wouldn't be able to tell the truth under those circumstances, then that's an exception to the 
confrontation clause, right? You know, so in that situation, and this is one of those areas that I think it's ongoing. It, it's it's constantly changing, but I believe that believe of as of right now, children can be an exception to the confrontation clause because uh, you know they could come out more damaged from the testimony and you know children deserve protection so on and so forth so because of that a, a child would not be subject to con uh, being confronted by the witness uh, you know so that's one of the exceptions there right you know so another exception is wrongdoing right so let me just go ahead and get into this right now by the same token, courts will not suffer a party to profit from his wrongdoing. Thus, a defendant who wrongfully procures a witness absence for the purpose of denying the government that witness testimony waives his right under the confrontation clause to object to the admission of the absence of the witness uh, hearsay statements. Right? Reynolds v. United States. Holding that the defendant refusal to disclose the whereabouts of the witness constitutes constitutes such a waiver holding that the defendant who silenced a witness by exploiting an intimate relationship waives the right to confrontation right you know so if if you're doing wrong and your wrongdoing causes that witness not to be available to the justice system then they're going to say that you waive that right to confront the witness right uh, just moving on, and all of this essentially says the same thing, but, you know, just from a different, just it's just reworded, right? The Constitution gives the accused the right to a trial at which he should confront with the witness against him, but if the witness is absent by his own wrongful procurement, he cannot complain if the competent, if the competent evidence is admitted to supply the place of that which he expects kept away. The rule is founded in the maximum that no one shall be permitted to take advantage of his own wrong. United States v. Uh, Cromer. Vasquez versus the people. To conclude that the defendant had forfeited his rights to confrontation, Vasquez holds that where one, the witness is unavailable, two, the defendant was involved in or responsible for procuring the unavailability of the witness, and three, the defendant acted with the intent to deprive the criminal justice system of evidence that the defendant then forfeits his right to confrontation, right? So that's it in a nutshell. My quick little synopsis on the confrontation clause. So you do have that right, but there are some exceptions to that right is where you've done some wrongdoing. If you tampered with the witness, or if you try to hide the witness, or if the government, they don't, they don't necessarily have to, you, you may not have actually tampered with the witness, but if the government can successfully allege that you tampered with the witness, or if they can successfully allege that uh, there's a suspicion that you will tamper with the witness, then, you know, they have the, they're going to argue that you waive your right to confront the witness. That's what they're going to argue. Now, in some cases, I think there's a game being played because they could possibly withhold the witness from you. I believe that your right to confront the witness starts in the very beginning of the trial process. And because it starts at the very beginning, you should be able to have a deposition to get witness statements before trial. You should have a right to an evidentiary hearing, meaning you're, you're going to bring the witness before court and you're going to look at the evidence that the witness has. You're going to examine some of the testimony that the witness would potentially give. And you get a chance to look at the credibility of the witness, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that I would imagine that could be done with the witness long before you actually get to trial and you get to the point where you're going to actually uh, question the witness on the stand, right? There's a lot of things that can be done. So I think, you know, games can be played where they'll still give you the right to confront the witness but they're going to do it at the very last minute. 
And because they did it at the very last minute, they didn't necessarily violate your right to confront the witness because you still got a chance to confront the witness. The only exception is that you didn't get a chance to get to confront the witness ahead of time. And I'm not sure if there's any case law on whether or not that's part of your right. And, you know, maybe that's ongoing lit litigation, but from a technical perspective, they could potentially give you access to the witness at the very last minute. And this is basically going to trip you up because you're not prepared because you don't even know who the witness is, right? So that's essentially it for this video. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, should you be able to confront the witness at the very beginning or the very start of the trial? Or do you believe confronting the witness at the last minute is enough for the government to give you an opportunity to confront a witness and to satisfy the confrontation clause, the Sixth Amendment confrontation clause. Let me know what you think. Leave your questions and comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe.